Well, after a couple of weekend messages across Twitter asking us to refrain from all political comment today, we are going to do that by coming to you straight. This Variety Hour podcast is coming to you live from the new AFL office in Shanghai. <laughs> <laughs> this is Sergio Paradise and Titus O'Reilly. No election talk, but there's plenty to get on with. Well, the only election talk I'd say is we tip elections, both us and the general public, <laughs> about as well as we tip our footy. Oh, exactly. I mean, oh, you, you look at the, the polls, and I think between 50 and 52% of swinging voters were leaning towards the Variety Hour podcast. <laughs> but, but once preferences came in, it, it dropped off markedly. We should run in an election one day on the, on the like, all our policies are about sport. Oh, that's not a bad idea. Like, you, you know, well, get rid of the protected so, so you, zone. You know, or... you know what's wrong with that idea? You'll end up a senator. Oh, can you imagine? Can you, I want you to be a senator. And and while I was watching the various coverage on Saturday night, I know he said no political talk, but it just yeah. did occur to we me as to. I was watching it. Uh, it was like going on forever, and you yeah. kind of got a sense you, for a while you didn't really know who was going to win, yeah. and it was but it was kind of boring at the same time because yeah. there was no big excitement. It was just sort of holding, exactly right. and basically it was holding on what it was in yeah. a way. And uh, I was like, man, we need Serge on one of these panels. <laughs> I tell you what, when I did vote on Saturday. I mean, yeah, the, the Senate thing, you got about 80 choices across. Yeah. So I was looking at, and I'm thinking, I, I don't really want to just tick you know, the, the one yeah, the, from a political party because yeah, I'm yeah. not quite sure about it. I agree. I was looking at I'm thinking, the Pirate Party, should I give them just n- the, number just one and number right. two? And then I thought, I don't know who they are. They could be some Fraser Anning type bunch of idiots, so I won't. But I was thinking... The Pirate Party. I wish I knew more about the Pirate Party. They might have got my vote on Saturday. Well, one footy-related thing just about voting is yeah. I voted down uh, – I was down, of course, being a Melbourne sport, I was down at the Peninsula. Yeah, of course you were. Uh, and uh, so I voted, like, down there. And um, I go in and who's in front of me? Because I go into the, like, the absentee voter oh, or yeah. whatever because you're, you're, your, you're outside yeah. your electorate. And uh, so I go and vote. And um, the guy in front of me is Grant Thomas. Oh, right. And do you know what was hilarious? He looked cranky. <laughs> what Even a, before he voted, he was Well, upset. first, as I was looking at Park, I almost ran over him. Yeah. Not on purpose, but he was crossing the road on the, like, I had to turn right. And he was, you, you know, when people cross, if you'd hit him. you know, people cross the road. At Portsea? No, this wasn't at Portsea. This is sort of uh, over Boneo way. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, you know when people cross a road just anywhere and they pick the bit where cars are coming out of another car turning right. So, yeah. if a clear bit comes in the road they're on, they try and cross them, but then sure. they almost get cleaned up by run turning right. Like, it's the dumbest place to do it. Yeah. To cross. Yeah. You know, there's a reason there's not a crossing there. And uh, so, he was doing that and I was turning right. And it was only at the last minute I kind of saw him. So, I sort of stopped. And then I went, oh, that's Grant Thomas, and I've regretted stopping ever since. Oh, exactly, because, I mean, you would, have, you would have cut off one vote. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so much more interesting, like, politics may or may not have changed in this country, but the one thing we always can rely on is sport exactly. to continue along in the ha- same way it's always continued. That was going to be my next question to you. The, the, the lack of change of government, will it affect how we look at sport or how sport is played out in this country. I don't think so. No, well, now we can focus on important things. Exactly. And sport always delivers something to cheer us up. Uh, and this and, morning... Unless you're a Carlton supporter, <laughs> but we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get to that. But uh, So this morning it's just breaking that Michael Slater was kicked off a domestic flight after a heated argument with friends. So um, then turned into a stoush with Qantas flight attendants. So he was on a regional flight from Sydney to Wagga uh, on Sunday afternoon. Right. And he got in an argument with two female friends that began to really escalate. <laughs> I don't want to go to Wagga. I'm on his side. <laughs> uh, maybe they just, you know, had realised, you know, had listened to too much of his commentary over the years because I think that would be quite a normal response. Well, wasn't one of, the, one of them his girlfriend and, and, and a friend of hers, perhaps? Right, that would make sense. Uh, yeah. I don't know if it says that here. This is from friends, but it says he was... Uh, this is quoting uh, Macquarie Radio Digital content producer uh, Nick Fergus um, said that he'd been involved in an extremely heated argument. Um, it's not, he's been described as not a run-of-the-mill argument. 
uh, which I know you're very familiar with. It was yelling, it was swearing, and it was only getting worse as they moved to their seat. That would have been fun to watch. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you, you know, you're trying to put your, your luggage in the overhead rack. So as it oh, all gets slats, he's not too happy. Is yeah, he? yeah. I would have started commentating the fight to it, just getting back for all the years I had to sit through him, um, just making really obvious statements. Um, his apparently witnesses said that he then, because he was fighting with these two women so much, he just then he removed himself from the situation and went to the bathroom of the plane. Now the plane hadn't taken off. Yeah. So you know you can't. And he, so he's locked himself in the toilet. He's literally gone and locked himself in the, like a teenager. Um, <laughs> So they were doing safety briefings and he remained in the bathroom. So Cruz repeatedly asked him to come out and he refused. Uh-huh. Um, the plane couldn't take off because you can't take off with someone just sitting, you know, having a tantrum. No. Um, so then um, it got delayed further and further and the crew were forced to call security who boarded the plane. It was delayed 30 mi- minutes. Um, and he Slater issued a statement saying, I did have an argument with two friends while boarding a flight to Wagon. I apologize for the inconveniences caused to other passengers on the flight. Now, that's his end of his statement. So, um, it's got a touch of the Will Andersons about it, hasn't it? If someone wrote to me, I'll just find it on Twitter. We did get a question. Uh, uh, where was it? Someone said... A last-minute uh, question about slats. A last-minute question about slats um, said... Where was it? Uh, said, will he be pulling together a one-hour one hour comedy uh, special <laughs> as a la Will Anderson? So, um, okay. Because uh, Will, he got, he got done. But he was so that was Michael, Michael White said, can we expect to see Michael Fl- Sw- Slater follow Will Anderson's lead, giving us a one-hour comedy festival show about his ill-fated, ill-fated flight to Wagga? Someone else over. wrote, Daniel Lee wrote, Gary Pert says he was on the plane and nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> he was on the one with Grant Hackett, remember? I was like, yeah, oh, it was all yeah. the the breast grabbing was all, or the chest grabbing rather was all in, was all above board. Um, Will Raw wrote in, maybe it was his 99th flight. Um, someone else wrote in, General wrote in, on a scale of Michael Slater to Michael Clark, who would you prefer to commentate? I'd have to say Slats by a mile there. Or well, it'd be more entertaining. Oh, uh, Clark, I would have to say was the was probably the worst commentator we've ever had, really. Yeah, true. Don't you think? Yeah, probably. Um, so what's Slats' problem, do you reckon? I mean, there is an undercurrent on some of the reporting that, that this is not possibly Slats' only sort of misdemeanour or, or heading towards strange behaviour in recent times. Well, there's sort of... Well, I mean, if you go off the uh, Twitterverse... Yeah. Um, you know, there's suggestions a lot of people are bringing up, um, you know, mental health, but yeah. that kind of is – mental health has become a bit of a catch-all for everything. Yeah. To the- I don't think it often does – like, there's a stigma around mental health that that needs to be addressed, right? Yeah. But I sometimes think when people sort of use it in the media and these situations straight away as sort of a defence, I don't know if it's necessarily helping – the I understanding agree. of mental health, I because agree. there's there's a few people that I know the public generally are going. Mm, I yeah, feel this is really? a bit. This is a bit of a cover up. Well, know. mental health doesn't excuse all behaviour either, and well, people with and that's people true. and I have some uh, knowledge of this, and I know some people have had like quite serious mental health things, like not you know, yeah. not that they're. I, I'm saying there's you know trying to rank a level of severity is hard, but I'm talking people that have had to you know have being institutionalised, right? Right. And I've had them tell me, like, come on, like, I never used it as a complete excuse for all my behaviour. Like, yeah. you kind of, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a line here. I'm not saying Slater's done this, is what some other people are leaping in and saying. Yeah. Other people are saying, oh, it's drugs and all this, but no one knows at this stage. Oh, well, exactly. So, I mean, it, it, seriously, he could have just, you know, had an argument with his girlfriend and her best mate and he, and he handled it poorly. How I mean, often have you locked yourself in an airport? But an airplane bathroom. Well, what deliberately? <laughs> <laughs> but accidentally, I just can't figure out the mechanism. Yeah, you oh. know, if you slide up, you know how there's usually a sign that says like bathroom or something. Yeah, if you slide that up, it has the secret unlock on the outside. Is that right? Apparently, and that's okay. how they uh, get people out that's in these situations. Out. They don't just yeah, because the if someone pl- passes out or something. 
Yeah, okay. I so there'll be a lot more of this to come. I mean, with fingers crossed, I, well, I hope two things. One, the, the very best for Michael Slater if he is suffering those sort of problems. And secondly, let's hope that he doesn't ever commentate again. Again. <laughs> but that's just been my long hand. That's been my long yeah, held I was, position. I was that's just not, about to say that's got nothing to do with no, how we feel. No, that's, that's just, just a new thing. That's just. That's just yeah. a sorry. That's not a new position. Yeah. Uh, once again, the issue of umpires in the AFL has uh, blown up. Can we say? It just rears its ugly head every week. I got asked about this on ABC Radio yesterday too about two things. But one, the general. I, I guess we could talk about a couple of issues here. One, the general standard of umpiring. Yep. Two, uh, there is a perceived uh, you know, the AFL sort of saying that the player engagement with umpires and fans as well has been um, getting worse, yep. more and more negative. Uh, and one of those is uh, Daisy uh, Dale Thomas, Daisy Thomas of yep. Carlton, allegedly called a boundary umpire an effing cheat um, after Sunday's loss to Greater Western Sydney. Was it after the game he said it? Uh, it says... Was, during, sorry, yeah, it was, during. It was during something like during the game. I don't know if you could really. I mean, did the umpire, if the umpires were going to cheat and try and fix a result, <laughs> not a game to re- they really needed to. And yeah, they, you know, I was about to say, I don't think GWS needed any help whatsoever. And even if you you take the 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 longest part of that whole <laughs> assumption, would a cheating boundary umpire have made that much of a difference? Yes. Would a, a cheating boundary umpire ever make much of a difference to any game? No, I mean there it's might like be moments it wasn't where, in or it yeah, they try. Right. There yeah. might be like certain. You might, they might come down to like ten seconds left, and they call it, you know, out not out or yeah, yeah, you know. So, but overall, it's not. Um, uh, Daisy probably shouldn't have said that though while he was up the pole at the at the, <laughs> the, the goalpost. Goal yeah. um, so you've got this. He's going to probably go to the tribunal. I mean, I imagine he's going to say, "I did say it." And I, I did it in the heat of the moment. I shouldn't have said it. I yeah. offered a full apology and all that. The, and then he'll get a week or so or a fine. Yeah, he'll, he, I reckon he'll get a fine. I mean, His problem's going to be they're going to want to try and make an example to send a message to everyone the, else. If he called him an effing idiot, he'd be fine. He'd be fine. It's, it's the word cheaters is, cheat is, is, is where, the problem yeah, he's yeah. got here. But no one actually, I mean, he should apologise for that and, and say quite clearly that he doesn't yeah. think the guy was a cheat and in the heat of the moment he used bad form of words, right? Yeah. That's what he says. No one's really going, yeah, I think that umpire was a cheat. Yeah. Like, there's no... And nobody's saying, oh, da- I-, I genuinely think Daisy thought he was cheating. Yeah, yeah, no, It's yeah, just yeah. a stupid slip it's... of the tongue. Yeah, so it's a bit of that case of, I think, you got... It's like, you know, with libel, Matt, you've got to prove that someone suffered reputational damage. Yeah. I don't think the umpire has. I just think <laughs> it makes Dale look stupid. Yeah. And he apologises. What I do wonder is, are the AFL just going to go, right, but... This is in the context of the broader thing. The, the big reason about the pole climbing, yeah. Rampy's pole climbing, that the AFL kind of came in and gave a bizarre defence of the umpires, yeah. of going it's about time and context, is there's a real push in AFL house at the moment to back the umpires no matter what yeah. because they feel like the umpires are under, under, the, hammer. under yeah. the hammer. And so hence you get some quite bizarre defences of things that are almost indefensible. Like, the fact they missed that and didn't give it a free kick is just... You can't defend it. It is... They made a mistake. But you're better off to say, they made a mistake, they're human. Let's move on. Let's move on, you know, and you don't re-prosecute a result based on that. If we kind of agree or suggest that that Daisy will probably cop a fine tonight... I think he could be suspended. Do you? The, the The only reason I think he could be suspended is just purely... Make an example of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. So. I mean, and to be honest, if you're, if you, <laughs> it's not like missing a Carlton game is going to really. It's not the biggest. <laughs> it's not a huge impact, is it? Well, it would have been bigger if he if he'd said it to a field umpire. Yeah. You know? Well, that would be bigger. It would also be bigger if there was like a really tight game or something. I mean, yeah. the idea the umpires needed to cheat was yeah, just kind of seventeen nice. goals behind. Yeah, it's, it's, it wasn't it a thing. A bit harder. Um, so he can't take an early guilty plea. He has to actually go and, and face up. So that sort of happened. There's there's a lot of things about various games this week. I mean, I thought some of the decisions in the West Coast Melbourne game yeah. were terrible, yeah. right? Just non-calls and calls. But I would preface it with this. I don't think it affected the end of the game. Melbourne had every chance to win that game oh, and Melbourne didn't. Should, so, should have been six goals and I thought some of them against the Eagles were crazy too. Yeah. And I think across having watched every game this weekend, I think 
there were perplexing ones at, at, at both non-key moments and key moments in a lot of games. The North, um, the North Hawthorne game had some weird ones. Yeah. Um, the Essendon the, Frio one had yeah. some really weird ones. But I've said all along, I don't think it's the umpire's fault. No. I think the AFL have made this game so hard to, uh, like, judge properly. And then the scrutiny is so high on the umpires. One, they're not full-time. I think they should be full-time played a lot more. I think there should be a massive... Would that make much difference on, on, a, on a Saturday or a Sunday when the game is being played? I think that there's an element here, right, where... They're human. Over the course of the week, they've got a full-time job they've got to manage yeah. with all the stress and pressure that comes with that. And they've basically got a second job yeah. that's incredibly highly scrutinized and physically demanding and stressful. So even if they were paid full-time and it meant they could rest mentally more during the week. or yeah, that's a point. Be- Because you think about it, now what do the umpires have to do? All the research about sort of human ability to think and cognitive ability is you've sort of got a finite resource of willpower or focus, right? And that the more you have to answer questions or think about things, the more that gets depleted over time. Yeah. So umpires now, they have to look at the 666 before the is right before, before the thing. Rebounds, there's, yeah. a, there's a thousand other things now they just have to, they've just been given more and more of a mental workload as top of the physical and they fatigue during the game. Yeah. That's the other thing people forget, you know, so... <laughs> we tend to notice, but, you know, then you've got this thing where it's also highly interpretive of the way... Oh, that's the thing. I mean, you know, do they, you know is, is there prior opportunity? Is there not? That's right. This so thing you, has to be... So that that so, decision has to be made in a, in a... That's right. But then you've also got more, umpi- more umpires. So yeah. the consistency between the umpire up one end and the one and then the other, we sort of see the umpires as all one whole unit. So the umpiring's been terrible. But really, the one up one end might be doing a great job but the other one isn't, but yeah. it's making them both look inconsistent when really what, only well, one of them is yeah. not making great decisions. Or, you know, the, there's a few things like Clarko has been a long time believer. I know I've read him say this several times that prior opportunities should be getting rid of yeah. altogether. You're tackled, doesn't matter if you had prior opportunity. Yeah. If you can't get at the ball, rid, rid of the ball. You're penalised. You're penalised. And what that means, a lot of players will tap the ball more and try and move it on, not grab it and hold it and then try it, you know. So it actually keeps the ball in play more, but it also makes it far simpler for the umpires. There is no... It makes it far closer to a a black and white decision. So so I think there's a... Did he grab it or or did he not? Yeah. So I, I think the umpires just keep getting given a tougher and tougher thing to do and then we blame the umpires when really my... This is on AFL House. It's yeah. nothing to do with... Well, it, while, while we're on the umpires, let me just throw this at you, a new thing that just come up this last week. The suggestion that they now have a, a, a fourth umpire as an interchange umpire. They, yeah. They've trialled it, as they say, very successfully at VFL level. Now, now how you trial have they ever done very a trial, successfully. Have they uh, ever done a trial, the AFL, and gone, yeah, this trial didn't really work? No, no well, possibly the AFLX, but they wouldn't and, you know, admit <laughs> that. But... Will that make any difference? Do you reckon? If, if who who then sits in 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 the grandstand and goes, you know what, this bloke up the southern end, he's he's been a bit inconsistent. We'll give him a quarter off and bring on umpire number four. But I can see I mean, a point of, of as if I mean one finding the right amount. I think to be a good umpire, there's few and far between, right? So. Yeah. You dilute the playing pool by adding the, the umpiring pool, the yeah. talent pool by having more because they're, they're not all going to be as good. But, yeah, giving them breaks or rotating them off and on, to me, makes some sense because yeah. you make bad decisions as you get more tired. Yeah. And all the players do it all the time. You see it like in the oh, end of a game or players are all spent. Minutes, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think there's sense in that. I think there's a few things that, I think there's a lot of things around rules that could just be massively simplified mm-hmm. that would make an umpire's job far, far easier where they don't, you know, well, I think prior opportunities are real. It's never been enforced in my mind properly no. anyway. So I, I think, you know. But to simplify the rule book might mean that eight people at AFL House aren't required Yeah, anymore. and you don't have, you know, no. people to come up with more crazy ideas yeah. all the time. Um, I, I think... The Daisy Thomas thing is a bad thing. There's a few things the umpires have done. So Razor Ray this week 
um, when Sydney were playing North Melbourne in Tasmania, he sprayed his fellow umpire, um, John Howarth, by <laughs> he saying... He doesn't mind a bit of it. As tensions boiled late in the game, Howarth took it upon himself to try and break up a fracker that was occurring near the fence, but Chamberlain wasn't having a bar of it. Get back and umpire the game, John. John Howarth, get in the game, he said. Now, he likes coaching everybody, players and his fellow umpires, Razor Ray. I have a real problem with Razor Ray. Yeah. Well, when we're looking at making the umpires... I mean, I'm a footy fan, so I have a real problem with Razor Ray on that yeah. level. But my real problem with Razor Ray, like, regardless of the quality of his umpiring, right? So yeah. let's say he's a brilliant umpire, even. At a time where umpires kind of, you know, you've got the Daisy Thomas thing and you've got the abuse and there should be probably less of the abuse of the umpires directly because we want them to, yeah. to umpire and we want the people to do it. And more, I think, the focus should be on AFL House and its criticism. You've got Razor Ray who sort of, ruins the brand of umpires as a whole because he is totally in it to promote his own yeah. self. And it's the anathema to what an umpire should be. You know, he did open mic. He's got a, um, a, he's got a talent agent. He's trying to set himself oh, up for a no media question. career. Yeah. He regularly makes he's the, the only it about umpire. him. And he's the only umpire everyone can name. The, I was about to say who can name. It, it, it's like the other guy. I, I can't even think of his name. The, the bald-headed guy is probably... Everyone knows you know, that that bald headed umpire, but nobody knows his name. But no, you, like I know some of their names, but not many. You know, but you and couldn't pick them in a lineup. No, that's right. Yeah. And so I, I think the the fact the AFL umpiring department have let Razor Ray do this, yeah. and look, they might have behind the scenes said knock it off, but the fact yeah. he hasn't, yeah. it's like you you dump him. Yeah. You know, you dump him. You say. This is it. not what we want umpires to be. Yeah. This is a bad look, and it's actually bringing down. It's like that old saying that you know, if you don't notice the umpires in a game, yeah. they've done a good yeah. job. Yeah, so he, he regularly does this, and the umpiring department of let him get away, and I think it actually damages all the umpires yeah. that are doing the right thing, yeah. which is the vast majority of them. Like, don't go into umpiring if you want to be If you want to be the, the star of the show. Yeah, it's yeah. not a star of the show yeah. game, you yeah. know, like... That's what I, I mean, that's yeah. why I find it bizarre when, so when he's getting into. You know, he's, he's been doing a lot more this year, like coaching players and telling players what to do. And, yeah, or stopping and, the game to have a discussion with one of them. Yeah, have a, like, have a bit of a chat. You know, mate, don't have a chat, just, you know, bounce the ball and shut up. Yeah, so I mean, so I think the umpiring is in real trouble. I think the umpiring's been terrible this year. Yeah. We say that every year, I guess, but. I but think as it has, you say, it's, it's not necessarily. Their fault. I don't think it's umpires' fault at all. Yeah. I don't blame the umpires one iota. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's some of them that are not up to scratch because yeah. that's just the nature. But there's lots of players that well, aren't up to scratch. To say, there's plenty, there's plenty so, of people in the yeah. Whole so job there are better and worse and all that. But I would say even the very best umpires now yeah. um, are really just um, absolutely like would be. I reckon would be finding this like a nightmare. Oh yeah, they'd, be, they'd wake up screaming at night. Yeah. I mean, they'd be probably if they were allowed to talk, they would probably say, "Oh, yeah. it, it is a nightmare." And so AFL House has to kind of get a bit serious about this. But they won't. You know, they're oh, like, I know what they're you know, it, Everything's everything's brilliant. Everything's been ticked off. <laughs> everything's been tested successfully. Yeah, we've we've asked some people yeah. who have vested interest in this saying this is good and, and they you, all say it's good. And if you don't like it, we'll move you to our new office in Shanghai. Can you believe they've opened an office in Shanghai? Yeah, of course I can believe it. <laughs> <laughs> See, China in some ways though, I was at a Port Adelaide game yeah. and I was talking to Keith Thomas, their CEO. All right. Um, and, you know, his view of the China thing is kind of kind of interesting in that for them, for Port Adelaide, yes, it's a new market in terms of, um, you know, potentially growing the game and all that. But Port Adelaide are about, it, it, about it's a massive financial win for them with sponsorship. Yeah, of course. Relate, and, and if it was couched like that by the AFL, like less we're going to conquer China yeah. and more, you know, to, to give our sponsors a broader market, but also get sponsors from China engaged in us. That makes enormous sense to me. And I think it's like often the case with the AFL where if they were just honest with fans and oh. said, this is why we're doing this. It was like St Kilda when they were playing in New Zealand for a couple of years. Yeah. I mean, again, the AFL, as you say, we're trying to catch it in terms of, of, of you know, 
we've got this country next door. Where they're, they're virtually Australians anyway. We may as well be playing some games over there. Yeah. Whereas St Kilda, to their credit, have gone, no, we make a million bucks out of these games. We don't make that in one game at yeah, Marvel. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So to me, the China thing makes sense if you're couching it in that language. It's a bit like the, um, I find, with international rules, right? Yeah. If the fact they pretend it's not a junket yeah. is... But I wouldn't have a problem with it being a junket. If you said, look, we don't have an internet, which is sort of what they say, but they don't say it bluntly enough, right? They pretend it's a great code in its own way. Yeah. If you said, look, we want to be able to reward the top 20 players in the comp each year or you know, every second year with a trip to New York and to Ireland. Yeah. And they get to play these games. It's a bit of fun, but it's a reward for you know, attracting people and to And also play. we need to reward the 40 or 50 people who are in the AFL house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, know, that's where it really... Needed, needed an end of season trip. Yeah, but when they say it's not a junket, you go, oh, really? So if this was being held, you know, if we didn't have the international component, it was just always held in Adelaide, yeah. you'd all be you'd all be busting yeah. a gut to do it? No, in the middle of summer, you'd want to all go down to the beach. Yeah, if it, if, if it was purely the competition, play at a Ballarat every year, you know, or yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah. at the ground there, that'd be enough. But yeah, I mean, but it's not a junket, even though. Remember, was it? I think it wasn't. Not wasn't the last one. It was the one before where they had a training camp in New York. In New York, and then they they had a a group photo in another major city. Yeah, no, they had a group photo at Times Square. That's in, right, in New York. Yeah, yeah. And then they had a training camp elsewhere, and then they had the matches somewhere else. Well, they, they then flew to Ireland to have the matches. Yeah, they didn't have a match in, in the, the, So they went to America to play a game in Ireland. Yeah, as you would. Um. So anyway, that's all good. That's kind of the Shanghai. I'm looking forward to you heading up that Shanghai office. Oh, yeah. I might put in the call this afternoon, actually. Uh, Carlton on the weekend. Did you watch this game? Did you? Or or games of stretch? Yeah, I I watched the first half. (laughs) And and then I was just going to turn it off. And and then I thought, no, actually, now I want to see how much they do actually lose by. Right. And, And hoping it would be getting close to 200 points, I thought would have been made it very interesting. Yeah, they, it didn't get quite that high, but they were. It, it's as uncompetitive as a side in that first half as I've seen since you know some of Melbourne's glory days a few years ago. Yeah, it was just appalling. They, I mean, you, you hear about that, you know they didn't come to play. Well, they just didn't, and the, the Giants were just running around like this. This is circle work. Well, when Lockie Whitfield, who is a very good player, but he had forty possessions yeah. and something like what three goals and something like I can't remember marks. But it was like. 12 yeah. marks or something. It was something ridiculous. You look at it and go, but, and then Josh Kelly had like 35. With a bit of luck, like, Lockie you know, Whitfield could have kicked six or seven goals. Yeah, so you, you look know, at that like and go, well, stuff. it's not a reflection of those players are good players, but they're, they're not, not that, that good, good you yeah, know? Exactly. Like, they, and when they're all getting that, it was yeah. all just one-way traffic. And But it was, like, that complete lack of any effort. Yeah. I mean, Bolton has to, I mean, <laughs> Gotta but be he has to be. Pump. Well, you know, there's this thing after I, I did an event on. Um, I did an event with George Megalogenis on, at the Queenscliff Literary Festival on the weekend. He's a I've mad. Always Richmond wondered supporter. how you pronounce his surname. Yeah, and he's a mad. He's a mad uh, Richmond supporter. I was about to say he's a Tiger man, isn't he? Very much yeah. so. And um, he said to me that um, you know when he's you know the Richmond experiment with Hardwick of not sacking him. Which yeah. went against decades of Richmond practice. Yeah. And was a real change and worked out for them. So that's, and then I think Buck's coming good last year. Yeah. There's sort of this narrative now where it's like, don't sack the coach. Yeah. It's gone from sack the coach really quickly to don't sack Let's the coach ever. Give him another chance, then another that's chance. That's right. And, and, and it might and, come good. And just as sacking the coach really quickly all the time, like you look at, um, probably Carlton sacking Ratton when they did. Yeah. Uh, and there's lots of other examples. Sometimes sacking them quickly has been proven to be a really destabilising bad outcome. Yeah. And that if you give a bit more time, coaches can come good. That's true. But just as much as that can be true, I don't think this never sack anyone approach. <laughs> you know, it's a bit like Melbourne extending Goodwin. Yeah. There wasn't a need to. Like, he had another year or so to go. Like, let him play this season yeah, and see, see how you think happens, he's yeah. going. And before you, you can always, you know, if, if he'd have started this season 10 to 0, you can always extend him then, you know. But yeah. there's this rush now to just lock coaches in for the long term, never sack them. And I think and it's, it's like the pendulum swung too far too back far. the other way. Well, you look at Carlton. I mean, okay, they're, they're, they're giving Bolton more chances than possibly he deserves. 
with, with this new mindset. Yeah. But they certainly haven't been that way with their players. They've turned over their list about four times in the last three years. Well, that's the only thing I can think is you look at Carlton and you go, they've got basically, I think, the youngest side out there or yeah. one of, depending on the, the week, but often the youngest, yeah. way less experience than anyone else. You know, they're just going to keep getting this being absolutely pounded every now so. and then. Did you see Chris Judd on Footy Classified? No. Last night? It was, he was more defensive last night than he was in any of his 280-odd games <laughs> last night. He was absolutely on the back foot. Um, and, and to be fair, he probably had to be. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, Carlton, they're, they're just all over the joint. And, and just to rub salt into the wound, their draft swap with Adelaide, Oh. Do you know the thing last year? I mean, it looks like they, they've given away the first or second draft pick yeah. for Liam Stocker. Yeah. Who may or may not end up being a handy little player, yeah. but he ain't going to be Patrick Cripps part two. Yeah. And and they've given away their first round draft pick this year, which looks like being, as I said, number one or two. Well, they're looking increasingly like number one. Yeah. And to Adelaide. to Adelaide. I mean, it used to be they used to just send their talented players to Adelaide. <laughs> but now it makes sense they just cut out the middleman and give them straight to <laughs> their draft pick straight to them. There's these two kids who play for Carey, Raul and uh, Noah Anderson, son of Dean, yeah. who they tip in going one or one and two. Yeah, they're saying this is a – I mean, they do this every year, but they're saying this is another strong year. Yeah. Uh, so all of a sudden – Adelaide are going, well, you know, how's our midfield looking? That's all right. We're going to pick up one of those two. And then Geelong's going, oh, good. We'll get them in a few years. Yeah. <laughs> so it is, I mean, it, it's, it's, there's a lot of questions over there. I mean, I, the only argument against sacking Bolton is he inherited an abject disaster. Yeah. Did anyone think he, he was going to be able to turn this around? He, you know, he probably hurry, needs but- five years to just get it. Anywhere, and by knocking him off, do you just send him back? You know, it's not like he's got a. It's not like this was the side that I mean that we all thought was going to suddenly play finals this year. Yeah. What's probably disappointing is by them doing that trade with the the draft pick. Yeah, they obviously thought they were going to. They're obviously underperforming, even against their own internal yeah. beliefs. Oh, exactly. Well, that, well, that was Judd's point last night that no, nobody at the club expected them to be one and eight and to be uncompetitive every second or third game, basically. It's also the way, isn't it? Because, you know... We, uh, if they'd had eight honourable losses, they'd still be unhappy. But it's not like being yeah. 80 points behind at half time. But remember you know? when you had that thing with, you know, under the Neil years where you would just... It was the same. Like, yeah. that's why I kind of get the Carlton fans' mindset, right? Yeah. Where you just go, this is completely unacceptable. Just yeah. fairly regularly. Is This is just... yeah. And I mean, it ruse to his credit, you, they stopped the unex, completely unacceptable yeah. to a fair extent. Yeah. You know, at least got him. And if Bolton doesn't get it back to, they don't have to necessarily win that much. But if you They've can't be turn in performances yeah. like that, that's what I'm saying. You can't be 15 goals behind at half time. Yeah, that, that's just unacceptable, as they, as the, they say. Greg Jericho wrote in: Is the only hope for Carlton to not finish bottom is if sports bet starts paying out on bets that they will win the wooden spoon. <laughs> Well, sports have been copping a bit this weekend. Oh, they're just they, all they, uh, huge have, have they loss. paid out on the Short and Bolton double, double yet? I know. know. Um, Declan Mason wrote in, what is more likely, a Carlton Premiership or a Labor Federal Government? <laughs> I, well, I'm not- in the next four years, <laughs> yeah, no, 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 there's, yeah, there's no danger of either no. of them. I think it would be pretty long odds with that double. Uh for Steve Wixon wrote in, would you rather be a Carlton supporter or the protagonist in a Frank, uh, a Franz Kafka novel? It's oh, a very illiterate oh, Steve question. Wixon, yeah. yeah. You know, Kafka-esque. Franz Kaf- Kafka-esque is, you know, the, his most famous one, the, uh, um, oh, what was it called? The Kafka novel, the... Uh, I'm surprised it's not... The trial. Not, yeah, the trial. The trial. Well, we're, we're, a bloke, we should explain, is arrested... But never charged, and they never explain what he's been arrested for. They just sort of lock well, him up. Well, it's kind of his novels. The protagonists are they're trapped in this sort of surreal, weird Where nothing's situation. Nothing's ever explained, or what and, it seems, and yeah. you know. Um, 
So thanks, Steve, for trying to raise the tone of our little podcast. Yeah, and you can see uh, how, how I stumbled with it that it was went way over my head as well, Steve. Adrian March wrote in, do you ever think that you and Serge are stuck in a Groundhog Day time loop where the only way to escape is to find the perfect Carlton gag? <laughs> is there such a thing as the perfect Carlton gag? There probably must be. Well, I, I, was, I wrote this in my column this week that I, I've, I've had a bit of a little... Uh, war going on with Carlton supporters on Twitter, right? Where they get really stuck into me as being really unfair and bagging them too much. Uh, they're the only club I've ever had that a group of supporters that have really taken me to task because, as you know, I'm quite keen on bagging my own side quite exactly. a lot. You know, I'm an equal opportunity offender when it comes to you know, and it's not my fault. So Carlton are just no are good. hopeless. Yeah. Like it's uh, it doesn't, but it really doesn't give me any joy anymore because. It is like, what more can you say? Yeah. It, I do find even when I make a carton joke, and sometimes I, I just can't help myself, but I do <laughs> find myself just going, well, it's not my fault they keep turning. They are a joke. Yeah. I mean, their own supporters say they're a joke, and, I'm, and it doesn't lessen it that my team's a joke too. Yeah. I'll make the jokes about them as well, but it is sort of weird. I mean, I remember I did the one where I said, uh, whose rebound, rebuild will be quicker, Carlton's or Notre Dame Cathedral. Yeah. And they all got so stuck into me because then they won one game and they're like, ah, oh, you know, we're away. <laughs> but they got a bit quiet since then. But it is terrible. I mean, I actually feel for Carlton supporters because I, they, they're going through what we've gone through. Oh, exactly. It's brutal. But again, it's it, it's Carlton supporters say so you don't worry too much. It's like, it's all in essence <laughs> going bad. Uh, Glenn Keppel wrote in, a Carlton week because most of their players don't have tats. <laughs> I've got to say, a lot of those young Carlton players, I, I can't see them walking into any establishment owned by Toby Mitchell, <laughs> put it that way, and, and asking for a full So you sleeve. think if you were the first coach, the next coach, the first thing you'd do is make them all get tats, all get, I want grow all some beards, sleeves. I want you all to get in sleeves. I want... I want Crips. I want some I want face. Both, I, I want, want both legs and, done. I want some neck and face tattoos yeah. even because we really got to overcompensate here. Yeah, exactly. I think you're. I think he's onto something there, Glenn. Uh, so anyway, Paul Carlton. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, they got St Kilda this week. They wouldn't would you, want to get belted by St Kilda. Would you want to go and coach them if you were an AFL coach? I mean, you think about it. Pagan went there and was terrible. Rats, who you could argue did a better job than most, got the ass. Yeah. Malthouse was an d- abject disaster. Yeah. Uh, now Bolts is struggling. You kind of wonder: is it is it a is it as the old poison chalice? Poison chalice, or do you do do you forget what happened on the weekend and go? You know what? There is there is a bit of talent there. They've they've got you know they do have some good young players. Uh, I could be the. I mean, and the, anyone any bloke who's who's that high <laughs> up up the pecking order that they're going to be considered for a senior AFL coaching spot. Yeah. They've, they've either got a track record or an ego big enough to think, I'm the one who can take them to the next level. Yeah. And and Rats, they're already talking that maybe they bring Rats back into the... Into oh, can the, you imagine? Yeah. Imagine Rats walking the, back The return in. of the Rat. Yeah. Uh, Cooper Cronk uh, retired this weekend. The Melbourne Storm and later Sydney Roosters um, play in the NRL. Um Huge star was one of the big three with Cam Smith yeah. and Billy Slater. Again, um, he's, I don't know. I know, he's, I know he's a Melbourne Storm legend, but I don't know a lot about him. But uh, he, he played in three or four premierships, didn't he? Uh, I think he's he had four, Well, he had four at the Storm and one at the Roosters, which right. was beating the Storm. I think a couple of his were part of that salary cap era. Oh, right. So w- whether you count them or not Did is uh, subject Cronky to your... Did get the free boat? Was that him? No, I don't no, think he was... got the free boat. I, um, I don't know if it was ever revealed who actually got it. I think because there was also a thirty grand gift card that someone got, which I always <laughs> love. I imagine it was for was K- to Meyer. I imagine, or- it, I imagine it was to say Kmart, and it's like yeah. just one of everything. Thanks, <laughs> could buy the whole store. So that was kind of they. That was hilarious when they kept a separate set of books. Yeah, and it was all there for them to be found. They, those, whatever happened to those actual books? They should be in the, in the, the NRL the sports museum, museum, sports museum. Remember yeah. um, for a while there, I, I noticed um, uh, Hutchie, to his great credit, when he took over Sen, got rid of it. Uh, he's never appeared since. But Brian Waldron used to get on SEN all the time. Yeah, I know. Talking about sports administration and stuff. And, and people would all do it with a straight face. And, and the other great irony of Brian Waldron is at these days, 
he does a podcast about amateur football. Oh, does he? Yeah, the VAFA. Right. And how to hide the money you're paying well, your... Well, I mean, you know, you know Brian, well, of, of all, the guy who kept the, the separate books and the, uh, went out and bought the gift cards to Kmart, yeah. he's now a pundit for amateur football. Well, oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah, um, you can't pick it, can you? Uh, so that's Cooper Cronk retiring. So that sort of only leaves Cam Smith as the, part of the remaining of the big three out of uh, out of um, the uh, the Melbourne Storm. Smith, so yeah, Billy Slater. Billy uh, Slater. Apparently, the word out of St Kilda is that he's fantastic down there. Billy Slater, yeah, his assistant coaching, yeah, and his leadership sort of qualities. Yeah, well, they're and pretty handy tackling coach as well. Scoring a lot of tries down there. Yeah. Uh, well, St Kilda are a bit of trouble. They've sort of, since round five, they've won a game. I just said Carlton wouldn't want to lose to St Kilda this week. Yeah. But St Kilda wouldn't want to lose to Carlton either. No, that's that's got yeah. danger game written all yeah. over it for both sides. Yeah. But Maybe both teams could lose that. The problem is Carl- for St Kilda is Carlton are probably not going to be as bad as they were against the Giants. No, I mean, it was a bit of a perfect storm. Carlton back. were hopeless and they're against the Giants who were just you know, Carlton are the year every second week side. I if Carlton get belted by St Kilda in the same way, though, yeah, then, it's, they're, they're, then Bolton. Bol- Bolton's like, gone if he gets he's de- get flogged yeah. again this week. Uh, the A League Grand Final was on on uh, Sunday. Did you know this? I did know it in the end. I mean, can I just say that football fans in this country, yeah, and are, are some of the worst advocates for their sport. Yeah, I've ever run across right. Like, so I'm a Melbourne Victory fan. I was a member in the first year, been member yeah. since. Like, I go regularly. I like the A League and I like football. So, I don't know how much you have to have cred in the you this do, world. You right. know the you cred. Do need cred don't you know you, the with cred they supporters? want. The cred you want. If to, the hardcore soccer fans in this country, yeah. this is the cred you need to have. All other sports are terrible. The only great, the only the one true sport is football. Yeah. And if you, cri- you we can criticise it, but if anyone outside of our little group criticises it, even if it's true, yeah. we'll go to war with you. Yeah. Right. So that I is, made a joke. True. So I made a joke and said, "Have the A leagues A league finals started yet?" Yeah. Yesterday, I'm not even saying it's a great joke, but it was a genuine pointing out that like the coverage of the A league finals yeah. has been woeful this year. It like has. even like. You know, a few times I've gone and tried to find it, you know, and it's been woeful. And the game is in real trouble. The ratings are, are, are the super ratings low. Are now, I know they had a great turnout in Perth, yeah. but then it was a 0-0 game settled on penalties. Yeah. I mean, no one, any neutral or new supporter that went and saw that is hardly going to be a repeat customer on the back yeah. of that. So I think the A-League's got enormous trouble and they're about to expand, which is mind boggling to me. But, so, but you're the problem. Not but the they game. all they all go, oh, get back to bagging the AFL. And I'm like, oh, hang on. You guys all bag the FFA yeah. more than I do. Like <laughs> I'm allowed to bag I the FFA. Up bagging the AFL I wasn't bagging the, the, the game. Yeah. I was bagging the fact that the A League and the FFA I think are doing a terrible job and have been and I don't you're think that's a sport, I don't think that's yeah. a disputable fact. Yeah. You know, but and it just made me go Oh, screw the lot of you. Like, who yeah. cares? And I'm not alone in this. I know a few key media people yeah. <coughs> who right. are soccer fans but will not cover A-League and not yeah. engage and will not give it any bump well, because their fans the are just year. vitriolic, you yeah. know? They just – they want it to be a major sport, yet they don't – they're not welcome. It's a bit like – to bring politics back into it, so Queensland and people who vote for the LNP, there's all these people online going – well, they're obviously racist. Yeah. And you know, well, even if you think racist, that, yeah. even if that was true, which I don't think, you know, I think it's a pretty broad thing to prove, but even if that was true, is that the way you're going to win them over? Yeah, exactly. Back over? <laughs> you know, and it's yeah. a bit like the, the soccer supporters in this country, they're like, they don't really want it to be a major sport in a way. They like that it's <laughs> kind of this niche, hardcore thing, you know, in oh, a way. Exactly. I mean, there was, there was someone on Twitter sort of backing your argument, and, and he was likening the A-League to the Herald Sun Tour. It's yeah, sort of yeah. all about that same level, yeah. you know, which is very much a localised niche sport. And yeah. sure, that might be cycling and what have you, but, but it's not exactly the, the, the AFL Grand Final or the NRL Grand Final or the Olympics yeah. of anything. So it does. It just amazes me, the attitude of it. Like, yeah. it's not one that, that's sort of welcoming to fans. 
And then I look at it and go, but I am a fan and you're still treated like, because yeah. you like another sport. Yeah, so exactly. they just go, oh, you like AFL. You go, yeah, but I can like two sports. In fact, I like lots of sports. Yeah. I would prefer it to talking to people. But it just does my head in every time. It's yeah. just the only sport I know that really does it. Like you bag the AFL, no AFL fan. Even if you're a non-AFL fan, if a soccer supporter said the AFL are terrible, you'd get the reaction from an AFL fan is, you think they're terrible. Let me give you 20 other reasons yeah, they're terrible. Say, you, you'll get no arguments from <laughs> yeah, me. Yeah, in uh, fact, you, you don't know how terrible. Yeah, let me, yeah, let me fill you in. Uh, this is a golfing story that you uh, picked up to, uh, and pointed oh, out to me. Yeah, oh, Brooks. Brooks Kepka. Brooks Kepka. Brooks Kepka. Now, he's back. gone on to be the uh, sort of the top player in the world. If you don't follow, he's on fire at the if you don't follow golf, yeah. Uh, you wouldn't he's have won heard four of, him. of the last eight majors. Is he South African? No, he's American. Oh, he's American. It's, I know his name sounds South African, but he's, he's an American. <laughs> he's in my knowledge of golf. He's um, just on fire, but uh, what, what I found interesting on the weekend was old Brooks, because he led from go to woe in the US PGA Championship. He and, almost struggled at the end, didn't he? Yeah, but, but he, still he, got he went into the last round seven shots in front, which was going to require, to lose, was going to require a choke on the level of Greg... Norman, Norman in 96. Yeah. But uh, he, he, he went into that last round. He was walking down to the first tee with his girlfriend. Yeah, and this uh, was online, wasn't it? Yeah, his girlfriend, a girl by the name of Gina Sims. And she, she's done the, um, and this was all caught on camera, you know, the, the good luck darling, and went to kiss him. And he pushed her away and said, I'm just concentrating on golf right now. And she wasn't too happy about it. She's walked off. Yeah. But after after he won, which he maybe that's what Michael two. Slater said on the plane. <laughs> I'm just focusing on getting in my I'm seat just right focusing now. Focusing on Wagga at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting a Wagga. But Gina seems she she got her kiss at the end of it, even though he only won by two shots. Now, if you want to know who she is, she's an actress. She, she's your classic uh, wag, as it's described in uh, in Australia. I think nowhere else. Yeah. Um, she appeared in Attack of the Fifty Foot Cheerleader. Oh right, oh, as the as the said cheerleader. She was the cheerleader, right? And, and you know the. Uh, so she's obviously a talented person on her own, right? Exactly. So uh, she she got her kiss afterwards. I love uh, the term wags. Uh, yeah. A lot of people think because you know there's wives and girlfriends in the group, but I often think it's because a lot of footballers and cricketers have both a wife and a girlfriend. <laughs> um. Now, we've got some great listeners' questions. Uh, they were on fire in. last night, the listeners. They were. Had a couple of good weeks of really good ones. Yeah. Uh, Nick C wrote in, when the Ds go inside 50, is it time they employed the George Costanza opposite tactic and target opposition defenders and try and kick behinds rather than goals? Well, Christian Petrarca should try that. They, I mean, that this has just been... It shows that the inside 50s for Mel make them a top four side. Yeah. But their inability to convert... And the thing about it, I can't remember if I said this to you last week, but when I was at the uh, game uh, against Hawthorne, which yeah. ended up winning, um, I was sitting in the stands and about five times in one quarter, they, the midfielders just kicked it to the top of the goal square yeah. where Hawthorne had just parked their ruckman. Yeah. And every time their ruckman either marked it or knocked it down, the Hawks swept it away. Yeah. And I thought, I'm a bit of an idiot. If I can spot what you're going to do yeah. from here and predict it Why every aren't you time, in the coach's box? then your opponents have certainly spotted it. Yeah. You know, they and, did it and, again and, against West Coast. Yeah. Shannon Hearn, yeah, he was fantastic. But it's, it's, it's not that hard to take 15 marks at, when on they're the back line when they kick it down your throat. I thought every McGovern time. and um, Hearn yeah. had started playing for us the way we were targeting yeah. them. It yeah. looked like regularly that we were hitting them up on leads. Yeah. If we hit our forwards up the same way we were hitting them, we would be premiers. Like, it was you know who's become unbelievable. The, 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 the biggest culprit of that is, is Angus Brayshaw. He, oh, but Brayshaw, been, Viney, I mean, yeah, they that, just... But that, also, the amount of ones you watch where they just boot it in up high. And hope for the best. And ho it's just hoping for hope the for best. Hope for Tommy McDonald to take a mark. And, you know, that, and then that everyone cr criticises Wiedemann and McDonald and all yeah. this. Then they criticise Frost and McDonald in the back line, Oscar, and all the vitrols thrown at them. And I'm like, guys, if we could hit a forward yeah. and not just bomb it in. As well as defend. Like yeah. that is the demon's problem, like yeah. in a nutshell, and has been for ages. So doing the Costanza, I'm a big fan of yeah, often I'm, doing I'm, the I'm Costanza. I'm happy with that suggestion. 
John Hunt said, do MCC members take cheese platters and wines to a voting booth to avoid eating a lower class product like a democracy <laughs> sausage? <coughs> I, I got a democracy sausage. Did you? And they put the onion under the sausage under this new is that health. Is Australia? Oh, it, well, this is this new Bunning said they were going to do it. <coughs> Insist on people doing it, which is because at one point some onion slipped off one. Yeah. And... Um, someone as someone slipped on the onion yeah. and hurt themselves, That's right. and so everyone went. So, so now it's all like, well, oh, like and, and safety, I like really. Yeah. I mean, one person that happened to. It's not like there's been a spate of them. No. And so, and so it really annoys me because. So I just threw all my onion on the ground in spite, <laughs> just, just, just hoping to, 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 to trip over a few. Queensland racists. No, I wanted. Yeah, I wanted to actually trip over all those people handing out. Yeah. Is there anything more annoying than the people handing out? Yeah. I think you said something online about you. you your favourite yeah. thing is to ignore them. Oh, no, I just like to everyone that, you know, the Liberals, then the Labor, then the Greens, and then the UAP, they all come up to hand your cut. I like to say, no thanks, no no thanks, mate. No, nah, I'm right. But the one you go, yeah, thanks to, is the weird-ass looking bloke from the shooters party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. anyways, what's going on here? Yeah, I think you said you always feel a bit nervous saying no to that the shooters party yeah, one, so you yeah. just take theirs. Yeah, I always want to. I always have this childish thing of taking them all yeah. and then turning around to them all and then just dropping them all on the ground. <laughs> just this most childish or thing. Or just fanning them out and go pick a card, any yeah, card. Yeah, yeah, know? yeah. I'll guess which one it is. Um. So yeah, no, we. I didn't take a cheese platter. I got a democracy sausage. I do love the sausage sizzle. Yeah. I love it, that is an Australian thing that we've just made something a big deal, and it's the stupidest thing of the whole I, thing. I, I, and it's the bit actually I people think care a, about. There's an actual app for your phone. Yeah, there is. There's to... a website that will show you what where they are and what booths to go to. See, and all that's that. a great Australian tr- thing. This is the thing I don't get. Like, the, Hawk dying this week, you know, there was a lot of things about, you know, being irreverent. There is an element, and this election showed it all on all sides, how serious we've all become. And yeah. I don't mean you have to be politically incorrect, but just being stupid. Like, yeah. the democracy sausage is a great example of Australians not taking something. Yeah, of, of Australian of making, stupidity. But of stupidity picking something not, stupid and making it a big deal. Yeah, when I say stupidity, not in... in- Knowing stupidity, the, the direct you know, definition of the word stupidity. Yeah, it's it's that irreverent stupidity, that Python esque kind of. Yeah, stupidity it's taking that something that is about, inevitably know? kind of stupid and not the main deal. Yeah, and making it the main deal, tra- acting like we all take it incredibly that, that seriously. That it's just as important as, as anything else. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Matt uh, Carga wrote in, given he wasn't reported but still broke Murphy's ribs, Mark Murphy, should the AFL put orange cones around identified workplace hab- as a Shane Mumford on match days? <laughs> well, given the pace he moves at, he wouldn't be knocking them over in a hurry. I tell you what, Mumford, though, I mean, he was, I thought he was, he is so often lucky. He, he kind of benefits from being seen as a bit clumsy. Yeah, the but boy, true. he's taken a lot of people out. Yeah, he has. You see him coming and you, you know, it is well, a, a big unit. Lucky yeah. he is in uh, safety orange. <laughs> uh, Matt Anderson wrote in, you haven't even mentioned the glorious sport of curling since the 2018 Winter Olympics. Was your feigned interest merely a plot to attract new podcast listeners, despite having no intention of providing us with up-to-date, detailed and comedic analysis of any subsequent bond spiel? A bond spiel is a curling tournament. Curling tournament. You looked it up as well as I did. Yeah, because yeah. I was like, well, what's doesn't... a bond spiel? Yeah. Uh, it is true. We only haven't mentioned it, and obviously we were cynically trying to crack that massive curling market, uh, and it is remiss of us not to turn this into more of a curling podcast. Yeah, Matt, Matt, let's, I'll, 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 I promise you, Matt, for next week, I'll check out the, uh, the Bond Spiel news going around the world. <laughs> uh, the third Earl of Footscray. Oh, geez, um, he's, got, he's got tickets on himself. He sure does. <laughs> Are you worried that Newspol said this was the best podcast? <laughs> compared, to, compared to what, I know. Earl? The, yeah, the, uh, wor- the best of two evils. Yeah. Uh, that's basically it. And Brett Willowwhite wrote in, if your taco shell breaks... Into pieces? Are you now eating nachos? That's not. That's De- not a deep bad question. philosophical question. At what point do tacos become nachos? Well, I don't know the answer to that question, but I think I know where Brett's coming from. There is nothing more annoying than when you get home with your box of taco shells <laughs> yeah. or your taco kit, yes. opening it up and finding five of them broken. 
Oh. Yeah. There is nothing worse. There is nothing worse. I don't think you There is know. literally <laughs> nothing worse in, the, in this world. I know. I now buy an extra box. This is what people annoyed about the election need to, like, realise. Like, there are far worse things going on. What, what are all parties doing about this? Yeah. You know, there should be a service that if you get home yeah. and your tacos are broken, you, you, you can press an app and a new box arrives. It should. Or, I mean, because nobody, and I, you know, I know I've had this decision as well. Yeah. I can't be bothered going back to Woolworths to say, five of my shells were broken. Yeah. Can I have a fresh box for nothing? It's, but you should be able to do that. When it's typical of their major political parties to not be tackling this issue, when are they going to stand up to Big Taco <laughs> <laughs> and stop what is obviously they are making a fortune off selling dodgy product <laughs> and no one is standing up to yeah, them? Like Mission, Mission Foods and, uh, and El, El Toro. Pa- El Paso. El, El and, Paso. Yeah, how yeah. much are they donating off the books to <laughs> our, our top politicians <laughs> to keep them from taking them on. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Yeah, that, that El Paso, that, they even sound dodgy. Remember yeah. there was in the coverage of... South of the border. Got re- remember dodginess. in the coverage of um, the James Heard and supplement scandal? Yeah. Uh, there was some talk at some point about a drug being from Mexico <laughs> and it got reported as such. And I think they were like putting Heard in a sombrero and stuff in papers <laughs> and stuff. And then it was discovered it was New Mexico. <laughs> It's like, oh, easy mistake. It's a US state. It's not, it's not yeah. <laughs> uh, So best question. Um, I was going to go with Adrian March. Do you ever think that you and Serge are stuck in a Groundhog Day time loop where the only way yeah. to escape is to find the perfect Carlton gag? And no matter what happens there, we'll always be searching for that. But there's no such thing as the perfect Carlton gag. It's a bit like, like... That will not stop it's us It's a bit searching. like the Richmond uh, ninth gag. Yeah. That got to a point where... It was like we'd not just us, but yeah. every footy fan. We'd exhausted that field of research. Yeah, the, the supply dry, dried up. There was up. none more. Yeah. We yeah. we really got to the point where there were no more to be made. True. Uh, and you know, I'm sure Carlton are going to do a massive late charge to the finals this year. Well, they want to. They want to have a crack somehow. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for listening, and uh, we'll see you next week.